Hey, it's Chris, the Supply Chain Doctor, providing you insights and tools to better understand and apply the Apex body of knowledge to everyday supply chains. We also strive to provide a history lesson into supply chain management and expose you to some of the industry's thought leaders and driving forces. In this episode, we sat down with industry veteran Greg Owens to learn about his impressive career going from an entry-level consultant at Anderson Consulting to various CEO roles. You can easily hear Greg's internal drive for success and passion for supply chain management. It all sounds pretty boring, so let's see if Greg can prove me wrong. Greg, thanks again for investing time with me here to talk about your career and more importantly, learn about your perspective on supply chain management. I worked with you briefly at Anderson Consulting, which, which later became Accenture. And at the time, I think you were a, a partner and the primary reason the company had a supply chain practice. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, let's start at the college level. You attended Georgia Tech, which is a great industrial engineering school. So can you tell me about that, why you went there and what you learned? Georgia Tech was the best school in the state of Georgia. I was a local resident. I went to high school in Georgia, and uh, I really never considered another school. It was Georgia Tech was where I was going to get the best education, and I was very interested in getting an education and getting into the workforce quickly. Uh, where you went to high school in Georgia, Atlanta specifically, or? Went down in Noonan, Georgia, just Noonan, south. Noonan, sure. And, oh, yeah. You know, back then, it was really a separate community. In today's world, more than 50% of the people around the Noonan area commute into Atlanta to go to work. And Georgia Tech is a great school, and specifically in some areas. So I think industrial management is one of them, the best in the world. Industrial engineering has been number one in industrial engineering of any school in the United States for something uh, around 25 years now. You did well, I assume. We don't have to talk about grades or anything, but I know it's a t some people say they, they survived. I did, uh, I, I did well enough that now I'm on the board of trustees, so uh, I guess I, I did, I, I made just the passing mark to, uh, to continue to be associated with, uh, with Georgia Tech. Okay, the board of trustees, yeah, and I'm uh, just a little, little reference point, I teach at the Supply Chain Logistics Institute with T Tim Brown, I'm sure you know Tim Brown. Tim, uh, I hired Tim at, at oh. Anderson Consulting <laughs> as well. Tim was with Systicon prior to, uh, to me hiring him. So let's talk about the, Accenture, the, the Anderson Consulting role. You were there, and as, and as I said, they just don't hire partners out of, out of college, so, but you were a partner eventually. So tell me what you did there and, and how you progressed so quickly. Anderson Consulting had just split from Arthur Anderson in 1989. In 1990, had decided they had to get in other areas other than just IT consulting. And one of the areas they wanted to get into was supply chain. And back then, people referred to it more as logistics. So initially, we started what was called the logistics strategy practice, the LSP. And we hired a number of people that you've worked with into initially the LSP. There were four regions in the LSP. There was the Northeast region, the Central region, the Western region, and the Southern region. And I was brought in to lead the Southern region. Uh, and we started growing our practice throughout the United States. And in 1993, soon after I became a partner, I was 33 years old, I got the opportunity to be the leader, to, to be the managing partner of the logistics strategy practice for North America. And, and soon after, I hired a few individuals in, in Latin America, and uh, we started the LSP then uh, was, was for the America. And did you work with, I'm just going to throw up some names there, Bill Copacino? Was he part of that supply chain? or Bill Copacino was initially part of the, the logistics strategy practice. He was the, uh, the leader in the day when I was first hired. And then he very shortly thereafter moved to uh, the strategy part of, of the business, which another area that this would compete with Bain and BCG and McKinsey. So Bill moved over to that. Uh, I worked with uh, the leader, then became Joe Martha. Uh, Joe's now deceased as well as Bill. And um, I became uh, the third person to lead that logistics strategy practice and, and the last because 
it was then morphed in 1996. It was morphed into the supply chain line of business. And at that time, I was tapped to be the global managing partner of the supply chain line of business. Okay. Yeah. I, re I recall the, what did we have downtown, Greg, the uh, supply chain the ideas exchange? Did you know yeah, about the that? Yeah, logis the logistics 2020 center. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was powerful. We brought a lot of companies in and, and teams to talk about that the was, future of supply chain. That was very powerful. Um, I, I was glad the firm uh, was putting the resources behind that and allowed a, a budget for us to really make that a powerful statement. And, and I think that's part of the reason that Anderson Consulting and later Accenture then led in the supply chain. Uh, we were able to bring our clients through there, show them everything all the way through the supply chain from procurement manufacturing into all the distribution, transportation, inventory management. It, it, was, a, it was a very powerful selling tool for us. So what did you enjoy? Did you enjoy the consulting side of it, you know, delivering projects or managing? Sounds like you did everything as a partner there, but you had to start somewhere. Well, I, I, I started in uh, logistics and supply chain consulting as a consultant. I moved from consultant to senior consultant, the manager to senior manager, to associate partner, to partner, to managing partner. So I did a little bit of everything along the way. I always loved the supply chain. It was, to me, supply chain was not boring. I love the challenges and, and the throughput and being able for, to use the supply chain as a competitive differentiator for companies. But I, I will say it was like a good book. I enjoyed each chapter as I moved along. I certainly enjoyed in latter years of developing people and watching them grow. And I made numerous partners within our group, you know, that people had come under that I had mentored and, and uh, helped develop and they became partners. And that was, that was very satisfying as well. And I'll say I enjoyed the sales process. I liked going into companies and talking to them about the improvements that we could make if they would follow our ideas and our concepts and, and uh, procedures. And, uh, and, you know, many of our clients were extremely appreciative of making them better companies by, by what we did for them. Yeah, it's about giving solutions, giving value. Good points. Right. So when, while you were there, were you, at, were you in the technology at all? Planning or because you eventually we're going to get to manugistics, but so what, clearly I was it. I had projects where the planning was a, an aspect of that, and uh, it, you started to see the development of bigger companies and the the need for more complex software for them to be able to manage their businesses more effectively. And then it was the big players were manugistics, and I I too I think was a big one as well. That's right. We were the and, we were the two. Uh, actually, I too is one of the reasons that that led me to main logistics. So uh, I'm uh, I'm somewhat grateful that that they were a strong player in the in the market. So why did you make the move to main logistics? How did that transpire? So that was um, I started getting recruited at the end of 1998 when I was the global managing partner there at Anderson Consulting, and. Manugistics was looking for a professional CEO to come in behind the founder. And I was getting recruited along with several others. I, I had put in place a partnership at Anderson Consulting with I2 Technologies. So I knew those guys very well. Also knew Manugistics reasonably well. But I would say there were two things that really led me there. One is I had the chance to become a public company CEO at uh, 39 years old. That was appealing. I, I'd always wanted to, to run a company and the chance to, to move to Maryland and, and to become the CEO of Manugistics was, was very appealing to me. I would say the second thing, and, and it was second, was that, but I too had a $2 billion market cap at the time. I felt that they were companies of somewhat equal stature. Manugistics had a very dominant position in consumer products and retail, I too had much more of a dominant position in electronics and uh, industrial applications. So I felt like if I too had a $2 billion market cap, then uh, we could work at Manugistics and develop something similar. And that was a, a challenge I, was, I wanted to undertake. Now for people that may not have the history, what, what, were you, what was Manugistics and I too all about? Supply chain planning and 
we we ran the gamut of the supply chain. It was all about supply chain planning. So both Man Logistics and I2 were very heavily algorithm intensive planning tools that allowed you to look at demand. Demand planning was actually our largest product, but to look at demand and then to be able to forecast what was needed for to, from a supply standpoint to be able to fulfill the supply chain. So if you, if you look at supply chain, you're always looking at cost efficiency, but you're also looking at fulfillment rates. You know, you don't want to go into a store, manufacturer certainly wants to, to have a high fulfillment rate. Otherwise, the, uh, the retailer is going to look at the, the manufacturer and say, look, you're really not fulfilling my demand or my, my national demand or my global demand that I need. I'm going to have to look at other suppliers. So this planning software that Man Logistics made enabled these companies to be able to plan and forecast more effectively than they had in the past. Were you guys doing any transportation modeling as well at that time? or? Yeah, no, good question. We did transportation uh, optimization was a huge product of ours as well at Man Logistics. And that application is still out in the market today. Every once in a while, I'll hear about somebody still using the transportation optimization package that we had. But you were always trying to optimize not only getting products out, whoever your supply chain was, but also being able to reduce whatever transportation costs that you could so that you were operating at an efficient level. Yeah, that was a big model, big for a while, understanding where your distribution center should be located, who they're servicing, all those exactly. things. Now, there were some other companies that came out of Georgia Tech around the operations management side, right? I mean, Don Ratliff and uh, those types of people were starting companies. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you go back to Caps Logistics, oh, yeah. uh, if you remember that name, Manhattan Associates is out there today. Most all of them have a, a, a very high concentration of, of Georgia Tech people, and, and many of them, the, the founders were at Georgia Tech. Well, on Manhattan Associates, while they're a warehousing execution system, I recall Alan DeBerry saying once, I asked him why he started the company, he said it was either a supply chain planning company or a warehousing company. And they just, I guess, I don't know say flipped a coin or whatever, but ended up being uh, one of the best WMSs around. So, yep. And Alan started, uh, we had similar backgrounds. Alan started in, in uh, consulting as well. He was with Kurt Salmon and Associates. And he also saw, and I think that was one of the things that really led me to, uh, to main logistics. We started to see that package software was becoming a way of the future. So at Anderson Consulting uh, or Accenture, it was all about development. Uh, if you needed IT solutions, it would, they were custom and you were development. When package software started coming around, obviously it was implemented much faster than uh, uh, something that you would develop. So it was clear that this was going to be a, a way of the future and that, and that, that led me, you know, into the package software world. Ironically, you know, a lot of the companies we've talked about are no longer around, but the uh, Manhattan's still uh, still a great Atlanta-based company. So they've done something right. They, they've done very well. So at Manulogistics, what were you doing there? You were running the show, but what, what were some of the things you did to make it successful? One, one of the first things that w w I would say what Manulogistics' uh, uh, strength was at the, at the time was their development organization. They had very strong software, strongest in the industry, in my opinion, when I joined. What they lacked was more the go-to-market structure. I developed a, a um, supply chain diagnostic tool, if you will. So we would go in and to any customer and for very modest price would look over their operations and, and benchmark them against our other customers and then show them which areas that they were operating very well in and which areas that they were deficient. And that was a, a big part of, of what we were doing in helping them get more efficient or more cost effective in, in certain areas. So that was, that was one area. The other area is we had to develop our sales strategy, not by territory, but by expertise within the industry. So, we needed more focus on retail people, on electronics and high tech people, on oil and gas people, and and so when I got there, it was uh, it was set up uh, as a territory, 
uh, geographical territory and bringing in expertise in certain industries where they could speak the language and they knew the solutions better that those that industry needed to, to be more cost effective or, or more efficient was very important. And we were of the size where we really needed that industry expertise and not operate by geography. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, people want to typically think that the salespeople understand their business. I think that's what you were saying. It, exactly. And, and that, that was not the case when I first got there. And then we just had to market more effectively. It's, uh, you got to get the name out and so that everybody knows who you are. And you can have the greatest products. We, we've all heard this so many times, but you can have the greatest products in the world. But if, if you don't have the name out there and people don't recognize it, then uh, it's very difficult to sell. So you were successful in Manugistics. I think I saw some numbers somewhere. So in a, my five-year period, we went from 150 million in revenue to 325 million in revenue. So more than doubled the company in that period of time. Yeah, that, that's a benchmark of success, I would say, by most measures. I guess you enjoyed that. Obviously, that's a that's a key factor. But what was your reason for wanting to leave Manugistics? That was uh, where we were winning the battle, but we were going to lose the war. So I remember going to a consumer products company, and I thought just to close the deal, it was it was kind of one of those epiphany moments that you have. But I meet with the uh, CEO of the company, and just he and I, and we're discussing us putting the software, maybe just putting the software in. And, and uh, he uh, he started questioning me around. They, all these uh, consumer companies used SAP as, a, as their primary ERP system, their backbone. And um, he said, how much money are you putting in product development? And I said, well, we're doing 15% of revenue in product development. He said, that's uh, that's impressive. So somewhere around $50 million. And I said, yes. And he said, SAP's doing a billion dollars worth of product development. And they have this product that they have coming out, APO. And I said, well, I, okay, I, I agree with you that they're putting a lot of money in development, but they're not putting that billion dollars in APO. He said, how long before they catch you? Three years, four years, five years? And I said, I said, that's a fair question. I said, let me ask you one before I answer that. I said, do you have a right now problem or do you have a problem three or four years from now in your supply chain? And he laughed and he said, Nope, I've got a right now problem, and uh, we're going to be installing Manugistic software. But uh, he really got me thinking. We were, we were winning a lot of battles, but it, you know, ultimately we were just not big enough as a software company. Uh, Three hundred twenty-five million. I two was a similar size, uh, and we, you know, we just weren't going to be the the dominant player in the future, and that. That led to the consolidation. Uh, Larry Ellison was already on uh, a uh, consolidation streak of um, acquiring any software company that he felt like fit into the Oracle mold, and and uh, I, I could really just see the handwriting on the wall there. Now, what what happened to Manugistics? They were acquired by Oracle, or no? Uh, someone else. Manugistics, I two, and. JDA have all combined together and are owned by a private equity firm. So you took three similarly sized companies and put them all together. So I can just go back a little bit. APO, that's Advanced Planning and Optimization. Is that what that stood for? And that's that, correct. That was, and that Remember? was SAP's approach to uh, adapting supply chain planning, really trying to get rid of the competition there. So yeah, I remember that. We used to talk about that a little bit. So Manu and I2, they're, they're still around in some shape or form, but just as a different organization. Yep. So after Manugistics, you retired, became successful or what? I mean, after all that, what happened? Yeah, well, the, uh, I took a little time off after Manugistics, and uh, that was good, kind of recharged the batteries, and wasn't sure I wanted to go run something globally again, all the travel and all associated with that. But uh, I did a uh, about a year and a half stint in Washington, D.C., running a uh, about a $400 million private equity firm. Uh, it's called Red Zone Capital. And that put me on the other side of the fence. We were, uh, we were buying companies and uh, negotiating um, bank terms uh, on, on terms of leverage. And, and I would say that I, I, that was the first time that I ever really looked at companies and, and really thought about the exit strategy as you were initially buying the company. So 
of, of thinking, you know, what do you do with this company? Is it a company that you'll take public? Is it one that is going to be better off being sold to a strategic acquirer? Is it one that private equity will end up picking up at, at longer term and combining with another company? And it, it, uh, it really started, got me thinking more about the financial aspects of the company as opposed to everything else in my lifetime had just been go into something, grow it very big and operate it and enjoy what you're doing. So a little bit of in the PE world as an investor. What I found in the PE world is I'm an operator. My favorite days were board meetings, board meetings of our portfolio companies. I, I wanted to get back in the game and I was interviewing around and got a call one day from Coiner Perkins, the, the venture capitalist. And they invited me to San Francisco to look at three companies they had that they uh, needed CEOs for. And one of them was a company called Iron Planet. And Iron Planet was an internet marketplace, very small at the time. This was uh, 2007. But clearly the internet was becoming the way of the future. And uh, in 2007, there weren't that many internet marketplaces that were of a substantial size other than eBay. But this one happened to sell heavy construction equipment. And I had bought several cars off the internet, sight unseen, uh, just looking at pictures and inspection reports, and and uh, really liked this concept of the internet marketplace. So I agreed to uh, to run Iron Planet, and um, it was in Pleasanton, California, and went out. Nine years later, we grew it to uh, just over a billion dollars in uh, in gross sales, and we were within about two weeks of going public. We were acquired by a, a strategic company for uh, for a nice acquisition price and uh, and so I, I turned Iron Planet over to them and, and uh, transitioned into my life now. Now part of that was uh, something that maybe you only realize if you're if you've been in South Atlanta Ritchie Brothers is that was that part of Iron Planet or I did a little bit of research. Uh, yeah so Ritchie Brothers was the acquirer of Iron Planet. Um, okay that was the company. This, is public, but uh, uh, Richie's a public company, and the oh. acquisition we uh, we sold Iron Planet for uh, seven hundred fifty-eight million dollars. Okay, no, I didn't realize that. I thought it was the other way around. I just I know Richie Brothers as a uh, uh, that big lot that I drive past going down eighty-five. Yes. When every once in a while they've got tractors. Sometimes it's empty. Sometimes they have tractors. Well, they have they have about twenty-five of those lots scattered around the world. So, okay, uh, that's, that's just one of them. I, I didn't see the other 24, so that explains a lot there. Yeah. So you've retired again? So you went to your second retirement? or? Yeah, so I took some time off. I'm on, uh, I'm on a number of boards, including some Internet and B2C supply chain type companies. But I most recently have started another company, and it's another Internet marketplace in manufacturing and robotics equipment. And we're doing... We have both the marketplace and we are engineering automation. So we're making robotic cells that will do virtually any task that you need any kind of repetitive motion. That's going very well. We started that company last year and I'm very pleased with the with the growth and the take up we're getting in that company now. And that was, again, back to my research, is it IGAM or IGAM? Yes, IGAM. IGAM is, uh, stands for Global Asset Management. And then there, the sister website with that is NRTC, National Robotics uh, Technology Company. So we have two websites. One's on our automation division. The other one's on our, our marketplace. Okay. And that looks to be, a, I won't say a South Atlanta-based company, but close enough to Atlanta, I'll say it's an Atlanta-based company. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I live south of Atlanta, so sure. uh, my offices tend to, to get located there. Close to where you are. So you have an enjoyable commute. Exactly. Well, that's great. Well, anything else that you want to mention or talk about before I kind of ramp it down? I, well, I know you're on the, you'd mentioned being on the board at Georgia Tech, one of the great organizations. What do you do with them? Yeah, so um, I'm on the board of trustees of the foundation, which uh, we oversee the endowment of Georgia Tech. I've been an officer on that for a number of years and am very committed to education. I, I feel that education changes more of people's lives than uh, than anything out there and 
uh, I just I feel strongly that if kids can go get educated and get a good job and they'll change their lives forever. You know, I think Georgia Tech certainly did me well and, and so uh, anything I can do to promote education or give back to the community, I'm, uh, I, I enjoy being involved with that. So one thing I like to, to conclude on is getting guest perspective on the future of careers in supply chain management and you know whether it's uh, somebody going to college trying to pick a career or going to be graduating from college you know what should they be looking for in terms of jobs or even there's a third one Greg experienced employees want, that want to make a transition into supply chain management so either either one of those perspectives what advice would you have I, mean, I guess what would you do if you were if you had it to do over again would you get into supply chain management what would you be doing today there's no question I would get into supply chain management I'm going to give you uh several reasons that I think that uh, it, it is a great place to to be from a career standpoint right now. First of all, and I think because of this global pandemic that we're seeing with COVID-19, we're going to see the repatriation of supply chains. So in, in my world, in my time, we were looking at more international supply chains. We went from companies that were more U.S. base where they were developing international supply chains and everything associated with that. I think you're going to see the opposite now where there's more control over the supply chain and I, I think you're going to see a number of companies pull that back into the United States. So that would be my first reason to that this is going to be a, a great career path. Secondly, the whole omni-channel, so the, the, the whole B2C experience that you're seeing now where most everybody in, in our day used to go to a store and they would, they would buy. You might, you might go to a catalog. You might have a catalog come in the mail and you would pick items out, usually over an 800 number back in the early days, and, and you would order a single item. But now, clearly, e-commerce, we are seeing uh, you know, a very heavy B2C component, and it, I, I think that's here forever. People are using the Internet. And the whole reason I went into internet marketplaces uh, with Iron Planet and now with uh, with IGAM. That's going to be another exciting area for uh, people's career. And then the third thing I would say is the, the same day delivery that you're seeing in e-commerce. This is going to really change some of these supply chains. So, and, and, and change through automation in my opinion. So you're no longer, you can't have same day delivery and do it the same old fashioned way that you were doing with somebody out there picking every individual piece and packing every piece. So, it's a, so you're going to see more and more automation of, of robots and, and automated equipment that are pulling these orders and, and getting those out from transportation, uh, uh, however the mode of transportation, whether it be drones in the future or, or semi-automated uh, vehicles or, or what, we're going to see technology play a large role in, in supply chain delivery uh, in the future. So those three reasons, uh, repatriation of supply chain and the omni-channel and the, the automation, I think are great reasons for people to get into the supply chain and build their careers there. And we all know that the importance of the supply chain to, to companies, and it is a competitive differentiator. So I, I think it's a great place. It was a it was a great career mark for me when I was graduating from school, and I, I, I still think it's just as exciting now as it, uh, it was back then. Some of the, the theory of my podcast, Greg, is uh, supply chain is boring, so I, I think you proved me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope I did. Well, that's, that's great. Again, Greg, thanks again for investing time with me today. Uh, glad to participate, Chris. If you're interested in CSCP or other APEX credentials, there is a YouTube video where you can learn more about bootcamp style workshops at Georgia Tech. Search on Apex Bootcamp Courses Informational Webinar. If you're in the North Georgia, North Alabama, Chattanooga area, check out the traditional class formats offered by the University of Tennessee Chattanooga Center for Professional Education, Supply Chain Academy. Optionally, we can bring supply chain certification workshops to your company. Just send a note to chris at apexcoach.com. Supply Chain Boring is part of the Supply Chain Now Network. We try to highlight historical events, companies, and people in supply chain management and create a picture of where the industry is headed. Interested in learning more about supply chain technology startups, mergers, acquisitions, and how companies evolve? Take a listen to Tequila Sunrise, crafted by Greg White. 
or check out This Week in Business History with Supply Chain News own Scott Luton to learn more about everyday things you may take for granted and pick up short stories you can use as general conversation starters. The Logistics with a Purpose series puts a spotlight on neat and interesting organizations who are working toward a greater cause. And finally, if you're interested in logistics, freight, and transportation, take a listen to the new series, Jamin Logistics and Transportation Experience, with the Adapt and Thrive Mindset Sherpa, Jamin Alvarez. If interested in sponsoring this show or others on Supply Chain Now, send a note to chris at supplychainnowradio.com. And remember, supply chain is boring. I left right before the name change. So I went to Man Logistics in 1999. So right before, okay. I always worked for Anderson Consulting. Okay, that's good. That's what, So I use the, the names interchangeably. But that's kind of what I want to do. The people that – so my, my theory is Supply Chain is Boring. That's the name of the podcast. But what I'm realizing is a lot of people just under, like to hear the history, you know, people that have gone on to be successful. Maybe I'll inquire a little bit about your personality – not personality, but how you were able to become a partner at such a young age. I think that's pretty pretty impressive. You know, those types of things. And if, if there's anything that's off – you know, you want to leave off, just tell me, we, don't, we can edit it out, but I uh, really just like to learn. And then I'm realizing a lot of people listen to this. They're young, maybe they're getting into the careers and they want to understand how to move up or what they should be doing. So that's kind of the, kind of the audience that we see. You're comfortable with starting at, starting out at the Georgia Tech level? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I mm -hmm. uh, did my okay. fair share of public speaking in the day, so <laughs> I'm fine. And I didn't, and you live in Georgia now. I thought you were in DC for some reason. I've been in D.C. before, so uh, Main Logistics was D.C. My latest one, Iron Planet, was in Pleasanton, California, so okay. uh, I've, I've kind of been around. I just talked to – I'll give you an example. I talked to Greg Cronin. I don't know if you know Greg Cronin. Yeah, I know Greg. Yeah, I, I chatted with him, so I'm just trying to get – those are the people that I know, uh, so I'm just trying to capture all these ideas and these stories and experiences, so if anyone in your network comes to mind, yeah, uh, a couple. I think we'd share. Chris, do you remember uh, John White that worked with us at Anderson Consulting? Yeah, the younger, young John White. Is young he, John he, White. So okay. young John went on to run Fortna and grew it to $300 million in revenue and then sold to a private equity firm. And I think, uh, you know, somebody like that that grew Fortna to, to that business would be yeah. good. Okay. The, the grandfather of supply chain was Dave Anderson. Dave worked with us at Anderson Consulting uh, as well. He's up in Boston somewhere. He, you know, you can pick him up on LinkedIn. Okay. Do you know uh, Jeff Miller? Yeah. Yeah, I remember Jeff. Yeah. So I'm. I, I network with him around Atlanta. So he's. He mentioned Dave Anderson as well. So. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's neat. Yeah, I like to talk to people. One of the one of the people I interviewed. Lean. You you know the lean concepts. The about yeah, lean, sure. manufacturing lean manufacturing and things. Yes. Yeah. Sir. So that's what I started out in my career early. I'm an industrial engineer as well. I started out doing lean manufacturing, and I read all these books uh, from these Japanese engineers, and I wanted to interview the Japanese engineers. And I realized they were all deceased. So yeah. what I did is I found one man from Oregon. He, he published all those books. He went to Japan, found these, these thought leaders, and published their books in English, and he brought them back. So I ended up interviewing him. It was a three-part series, but that's – you know, that's the kind of stuff that's really, I think, is interesting, you know. The older guys aren't, aren't around so much anymore. You might, you might be able to get in touch with Alan DeBerry and talk about Manhattan. So. <laughs> he is, he is num no offense to you, but he is number one on my list. Uh, well, maybe he is now. I could say you were number one. He, he moved up. Uh, I've been trying to get him for a long time. He, we were actually neighbors. His house is near mine. His, his original house is near mine, I should say. But uh, he's a hard man to track down. Yeah. Yeah, he's. I think he's spending his time in Washington D.C. now too. Oh yeah, I heard yeah. he was on a. I heard he was living on a boat. He was. He's he's back in D.C. Okay, with his with his yeah. new startups. Okay, I will persist until I succeed on that one. That would be a great one. 